Hi, my name is David Coppins. I'm the co-founder and CEO of IntelliCare. We are in the midst of a full-blown nurse staffing crisis in this country. We have never seen anything like it. And frankly, it is putting the future of healthcare in our country at risk. While media headlines have concentrated on the impact of the pandemic driving nurses out of the profession, coverage just doesn't tell the full story. Nurses have been overworked, undervalued, and burnt out long before COVID hit. COVID accelerated it, put a spotlight on it, but it's been going on for years. And we really need to understand this next point. This massive nurse shortage is not gonna solve itself simply when the pandemic subsides. While these issues drive in the exodus, start with the commoditized way nurses are treated in the nation's healthcare model, there are ways that we can reduce the burden on nurses through technology. And I'm excited about the potential here. Now, in order to be effective, of course, nurses have to be involved in the creation and the implementation of these new technologies. Let's not create them in a vacuum. For all the reasons I just mentioned, we felt it was important to bring together this panel of experts. Each speaker you will hear from today has direct experience with how technology can relieve some of the greatest pressure on nurses and help them be even more effective at the amazing work they do. If you are inspired by what you see today, please spread your ideas. Please support action and enjoy. <music>Welcome to this Tech Crunch webinar, Can Technology Solve the Nursing Staffing Crisis? I'm Rebecca Love, the Chief Clinical Officer at IntelliCare. As a nurse, my life's passion is centered around empowering nurses and identifying the ways we can sustain, build, scale, and strengthen nursing's impact on the future of healthcare. The nursing profession in America is in crisis. 2020 and 21 was the largest exodus from the nursing profession in US history. And the demand for the largest occupation in the healthcare sector is rising across the country as 500,000 nurses are expected to retire by 2022 and 900,000 nurses are expected to leave the profession over the next five years. While COVID-19 is certainly a primary contributor to the shortage, a multitude of issues has been driving nurses out of the profession since long before the pandemic started. At the core of the exodus is a broken staffing model for nurses. The rigid scheduling of eight to 12 hour shifts to fill a 24 seven demand is robbing nurses of a work-life balance and driving a burnout rate seen in few other professions. While providing technology is certainly not a cure-all for nurses who have been a victim of the shortcomings of the US healthcare system, tools to reimagine and redefine how nurses work can go a long way in keeping more by the bedside and preserving the future health of our nation. Join me today are four leaders who are at the forefront intersection of some of the issues burdening Americans, nursing professionals, and technologies that can help alleviate them. Let me introduce to you David Coppins. David is the co-founder and CEO of IntelliCare. As IntelliCare CEO, David is dedicated to empowering nurses to redefine how they work through and access the right technologies. Next, Ashima Gupta. Ashima is the Director of Global Healthcare Strategy and Solutions at Google Cloud. She spearheads healthcare strategy and solutions for Google Cloud, and in this role, she sets the direction for transformative healthcare solutions and leads engagements with key healthcare executives to help transform their business strategies to define new models for care, revenue generation, and improved care experiences. Next, Dr. Rhonda Collins. Dr. Rhonda Collins is the Chief Nursing Officer at Vocera, where she works closely with nurses, physicians, IT professionals, and other healthcare leaders around the world to improve the lives of patients, families, and care teams. Next, Dr. John Parolo. Dr. John Parolo is a healthcare leader who has been involved in the evolution, deployment, and optimization of clinical technology, data, and analytics solutions across the continuum of care delivery venues for the last 20 years. He is a clinical thought leader and the former chief medical and informatics officer at Ascension Health. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. We know that this year has been an incredible year in healthcare uh, across the entire spectrum. Um, and a question that I would like to pose to you, and we'll start with Rhonda, how can technology be leveraged to decrease the strain on nurses and reduce burnout? 
It's a great question. <laughs> I, you know, the goal with nurses is to keep them mobile, right? To untether them <laughs> from the traditional work environment. And to do that, you have to provide them with the right technology. If you think about in your own personal life, how much of your technology follows you from your home to your car, to your office, to pick up your children or whatever you're doing in your life, it keeps you connected and it keeps you effective in your life. And we can't take that away from nurses. Frequently when they enter their work environment, they're putting away what makes their personal lives convenient and having to use what is very dated, such as you know landlines and fax machines and all of those things that we see them having to use. Um, we we see them using multiple disparate devices. You know, with with this instrument, you can talk to this whole group of people, and with this one, you know, this device, you can talk to that other group of people. And with this one, you have to page and wait and hope that somebody calls you back. And so when, I, you know, all the research I've done on how to manage nurses in their work environment and how to get them to adopt technologies, um, the number one issue they, they say that really congests their day is just finding people. You know, it's, it's, no, it's not a, um, a huge clinical issue. It's nothing that has anything to do with making somebody better. It's just trying to find the right people. And uh, it's those little things that just wear people down over time until they're like, this is just so difficult. I am frustrated with this. And we start to see the attrition that we're seeing. And John, I mean, you just, you've been in healthcare your entire life, you know, working by the bedside as well. You know, what is, what is resonating with you, what Rhonda is saying? Yeah, I think, I think Rhonda hits on, on the practicality of making a nurse's job easier, more intuitive, more streamlined. I mean, physicians have a unique view to nursing. Uh, we work with them closely. We see all that they do. And it is, I mean, it's kind of not short of miraculous, really. You know, they are the hub of care that goes on for a patient. They manage logistics. They manage communication. They conduct clinical surveillance. They carry out the maintenance, the health maintenance of a patient, you know, when they're, when they're being cared for. And, you know, technology, I think, to be frank, has poorly served them to date. Uh, it's been uh, fragmented. It's not taken into account all that they have to do. And so as we talk about technology elevating that experience and, and really elevating the experience will, is what will short circuit burnout to some degree. Uh, I think we have to be very uh, intentional about the technology accounting for, for really the vast array of work that they do. Absolutely. And, and you know, Ashima, you're, you're sitting at the head of, of Google Health Cloud right now. And what is your perspective from that level with regards to the, the conversation we're having at hand? Yeah, absolutely, Rebecca. I will double down on what Dr. Perola just said. Um, if you look into, as, as someone who's now in the technology company, but I also spent years at Kaiser Permanente, a long time technology has been kind of handed over or poorly rolled out, but the opportunity for technology is, is tremendous. I'll give you four very practical examples that I've seen now. Uh, the number one uh, that came into light was a virtual nursing station. This was in the peak of the pandemic, we work in Mount Sinai and uh, the rapidly moving situation with COVID-19 made well, it was made even more dire because of a lack of PPE. There was government mandate to ramp up capacity for the ICU bed availability. There was shortage of nursing. So the Mount Sinai innovation team worked with Google and we deployed this Nest cameras and there were two cameras, hundreds of rooms where one camera was doing the vital, the other camera was doing audio video communication. And the live video stream was then transferred over to this newly constructed, the workstation for the nurses, which was by the way in the hospital, but it prevented them from making frequent trips inside the code rooms, but being able to monitor and step in when they needed to. And that was rolled out in the matter of you know, weeks. So what I'm seeing is when there's a necessity, the solutions were spun up, but the solutions have applicability beyond COVID as well. So this was uh, the virtual nurse case example. And the second example I will say is um, 
we away from Maleva that uh, Dr. Barola just mentioned that the click fatigue. Right? Today, we see 96% of hospitals have adopted DHRs. It's up from 9% in 2008. But these systems, as we all talk about, were optimized for billing. They were not very succinct for patient care, or they were clumsy to use by nurses and, and physicians. And so the opportunity here with the data interoperability is there are many systems, we are making them easy by logging in and logging out by the cards, but can the data flow easily from within the systems and the new interoperability rules speak to that? Can it help reduce the click fatigue by creating seamless data exchange? And by the way, it will be good for patients as well. Uh, when you go as a patient and you need your patient records, today you get a CD-ROM. So can we make it more digital, more API enabled? I think that's the opportunity. The third opportunity I see, which uh, has um, risen to the top is the next frontier of innovation in AI is going to be the productivity segment uh, or AI powered assistance. Applications that assist nursing care and providers by using AI and machine learning uh, train medical models to for note taking, for capturing um, the voice and the interface as a note, and then creating and uh, adding that to the EHR. So these are uh, new medically NLP voice as a new interface. These, this is emerging because can we reduce the burden? Again, this is not just the bright and shining object, but the uh, the premise here is there are a lot of manual, repetitive, and redundant tasks that can be automated. So imagine a chat bot that a patient can ask questions, it's a conversational chat bot. They can ask multiple questions, if it, freeing up nurses' time, but they cannot answer all the questions. So the trick is to find out the applicability. And the final point is around scheduling, and this is the work in telecare David and you, Rebecca, are doing. A growing number of patients receive care in multiple care settings, hospital, home care, and then can we bring the level of production and scheduling? Can we make it easy and give nurses the agency to manage their time and giving them the flexibility? So these are the four areas that I see uh, will be key, but uh, as Dr. Perola said, I will caution that we need to take this technology there so that they are easy to use. They are built with nurses as stakeholder in co-creation of these solutions, because otherwise these will be very clunky as we roll them out. So um, we need to be cautious about how things move in healthcare, who are the users and, and somebody who comes from tech and also from Kaiser, I think that's the bridge that we need to build in bringing nurses uh, to the table, like as Rhonda said. So it's a long bit of answer. <laughs> so many aspects of technology here. Well, thank you, Ashma. That was very helpful to understand. And, you know, David, just hearing what Ashma was explaining of, you know, all of these impacts that can happen in healthcare around technology, but specifically mentioning scheduling, what are you seeing and hearing from the front line as we're dealing with this burnout and, and scheduling and work-life balance in the nursing arena? Yeah. Uh, so I think one of the biggest issues that uh, that nurses are have felt, and certainly that's the feedback we've been given. Again, cautioning, I'm not a nurse, uh, but the feedback that we do talk to thousands of nurses is that um, the the scheduling, and, and that's a that's a broad topic, but the inflexible scheduling is one of those um, elements that makes it extremely difficult. Um, that it's uh, uh, their schedules are laid out far in advance; they have no flexibility um, around that. We had a uh, one nurse come to us who uh, was working in one of the major health systems, and she. Um, her husband was coming home from Afghanistan. It was, you know, very exciting, you know, time, uh, 30 days in advance. Uh, she was, she asked for a day off. Um, and uh, as the date, but the, the request was actually denied as the date came up. Um, and so uh, she had no choice but to, to leave. And uh, now she's, of course, you know, working um, in a, you know, float pool, PRN, PRD type capacity. But the, I think there's, there's scheduling and flexibility, and then there's that feeling of always being on call. Even if you're not technically on call, you're 
feeling like you're constantly on call because you're constantly getting texts and phone calls to say, we need help. Can you come in? Can you come in? And, um, and that, um, that, you know, and nurses, uh, hard to generalize, but generally speaking, nurses have respond often to a call for uh, of need, like somebody's in need, somebody help, needs help, right? So they feel this kind of just compulsion that I, I really, I need to go help. I need to go help my colleagues. I need to go help these patients. I need to be there. And then, uh, you know, and the feedback we get is that that just leads to that burnout. So COVID is, is, is absolutely accelerated this, um, but it is, it is something that uh, primarily all types of healthcare institutions, uh, whether it's health systems or post-acute, it, they're not quite understanding the damage that that is causing and actually, you know, contributing to, to the exodus um, in this case. So solution back to that is, you know, and you probably couldn't have done this without technology previously, but, uh, but there has to be a way to be more, more schedule uh, forward. So meaning, um, be more progressive in that way, being flexible, uh, being um, uh, being able to reduce certain shifts. I mean, we have a lot of nurses that are uh, feeling like they're being forced to retire because they can't handle these long shifts either, and uh, and especially with the pressure that, that they're feeling currently. So uh, you know, there's kind of an acceleration in that retirement element. Anyway, can, can we reduce the, the number of hours required for some people instead of a 12 hour or even an eight hour, can they do a four or six hour? That, you know, if it's that or somebody leaving, you know, let, let's try to keep somebody around. If the scheduling system is so inflexible, then hire a person, a manual effort to move things around uh, to, to make sure that, you know, we can accommodate uh, the nurses that are feeling close to burnout. So. You know, it's interesting, you know, Rhonda, you and I have, are nurses um, by training, and there's a number of issues that come out at us uh, with regards to burnout and staffing and shortages along these lines. And the inflexible nature of our, our work-life balance absolutely exists. Um, and, but the question that I have is we're hearing so much about burnout and there is a, there seems to be, I, I think a fundamental disconnect of the understanding of burnout in nursing and burnout in the general, in the general idea of the word. And I was hoping that you could give us a little bit of insight from your experiences as well on, on what is defining burnout in, in nursing and how is it different than what we might be seeing elsewhere? Right. Uh, thanks. You know, I, I've listened to this word burnout for years and um, it started to become ineffective because we just used it to describe everything that was wrong. <laughs> oh, well, they're just burned out or that's, you know, you, you, I would move them to here because they're burned out on this particular topic. And then I, I started thinking, you know, we're blaming the individual for being burned out when it's the environment that's delivering the issue that's burning them out. And so really I've, I've just come to the conclusion that burnout is a work-related injury and we have to treat it as such. So instead of focusing on the individual and blaming the individual and, you know, we, we're constantly putting together resilience packages or bringing in consultants to talk about self-care or, uh, you know, consultants to talk about how do you um, cope. Coping skills are very popular. When in reality, the work is the issue and, and we have to deal with the work. Um, so how do you do that? Well, there's multiple things. You know, I look at nurses who've been given pizzas and healthcare hero signs in the yards and cookies and all of these kinds of things, which I'm sure they're very grateful for it. But what they really want is for the environment to be better, to feel like they have more control over that environment and to have the tools or the skills that they need to do their job. Um, so then when you go back and ask, what do you need to do your job? You know, I need to be able to come to work and utilize the conveniences of my personal life and my work life. Or I need to be able, when you send me into a COVID room and I'm still having to put things up to my face to even just find somebody with more experience. You know, I spoke to a young nurse who uh, had just been working less than a year and she was put to work at night on nights um, in ICU. 
And her biggest issue was that she couldn't find the more experienced nurses to guide her when she felt insecure. And when she was telling me the story, her eyes filled up with tears and she said, I just couldn't do it. And then she looked at me straight in the eye and she said, I will never go back. The statistics tell us that the number one attrition right now are nurses with less than one year of experience. That is the highest number of nurses or the statistic leaving the profession. Now, whether they're leaving the profession to go, you know, for, for travel work, but are they leaving entirely? I don't have that statistic, but less than one year experience are our most fragile and they're out of here. For the first time ever in the history of nursing, retirement is in the top three reasons that nurses are leaving the profession. <laughs> Part of that is because of the baby boomer generation. And part of that is because they said, I'm not sticking around for round two, three, four, five, six of COVID. It's just, I'm, I'm exhausted with this. Um, we have technologies. I mean, we're here to talk about technology. We have technology that can carry the burden of memory, push information to the nurse on the go, consolidate teams, allow them to move in the environment that they move in and in the context that they work in. When I've done my research on nurse acceptance of technology, the number one thing that guarantees acceptance is, does it work within the context of my care? I don't really care if it's four clicks or five clicks or how, whatever the magic number of clicks are, if it really works, that's what I care about. And so that's um, when I, I did my latest research on that. And the issue was, if it was convenient, was almost statistically irrelevant. <laughs> the, most, the most overwhelming statistically relevant was it has to fit within the context of my work. And what we found during COVID was that nurses wanted to be hands-free. They wanted to be able to communicate while wearing full PPE. They needed certain particular things that allowed them to function in the context of their work. And so that's what I, I say as um, people who are engineers and tech related, when you look at how people work, it's you have to understand their workflow before you can design the technology. Because if you start designing technology and then you're trying to pound you know, the, the nurse into the workflow of the technology is where you get this extreme fatigue and lack of adoption. Uh, nurses saying, this is too hard, you've overwhelmed me and I'm done. And I, I don't want to sound like nurses are delicate flowers because we're not, we're, we're really some of the most resilient and um, focused people you will ever meet. But I do think that particularly for my profession, we have to intentionally dismantle what got us here. <laughs> and that means we have to look at how do we schedule? How do we provide them the tools that they need? We have to question regulatory guidance. We have to question education. We have to question everything. This is our opportunity. We have to stand up and as leaders say, you know, what we really need is this or that, uh, rather than saying, we're gonna solve this new problem with our old tools because it's not working. And, and one, one issue just on that is the issue of travel nurses, which is just an overwhelming topic right now, that they're spending millions of dollars on travel nurses, paying them three times the salary of the nurses here staying. We have the issue of recruitment and we have the issue of retention. And so I, I think what we have to acknowledge is in the past, we've used travel nurses because we can spend $6 million for three or four months, you know, rather than raising all the salaries forever. That seemed to make better business sense to us, but this is not the same problem. This is not a three month issue. It is a decade issue and it has to be addressed. No, thank you, Rhonda. And, you know, Ashima, you know, how are you feeling when you're hearing what Rhonda's saying? I mean, obviously, you know, intentionally dismantling what we have built here to redo is definitely at the forefront of what a lot of technology companies are looking at in healthcare. I think um, Rhonda hit it on several points. Um, first is we need to address the burnout, but we also need to ensure that their time when uh, Rana talks about the cognitive overload, when you already have something on your mind that something needs to get done. And that cognitive overload is where I believe we can add and create more value, give them more time so that they can then take care of patients. 
But at the end, technology is a means to an end. And, and today, as Dr. Parola was mentioning, it's clunky. And, and, and we need to get to a point where technology is an invisible enabler. It's in the background, but uh, there's a point solution fatigue. There's a solution for everything that then we roll out to the nurses. So one of the takeaways that we have learned in, in this, um, the PP example that I gave for Mount Sinai, it was widely uh, received and accepted because it solved the problem for the nurses, right? We co-created with them, they were part of designing the solution with us. So it's not just about bringing a camera to a patient's room. We need to bring nurses into this dialogue and we need to listen, we need to listen and, and test and iterate like we do in software engineering. In, in general, in technology, you don't solve or launch the very big first product and it's a, it's a success. You iterate, you learn, you do A-B testing. And I think we need to get that engineering approach and how we roll out the systems, but there's a very, very high bar. And, and the high bar is that the solution needs to work. We're talking about medical setting, but the methodology of introducing new technology of listening to the nurses it, it is important. And I believe that's where Rebecca, you and I have talked about the education opportunities. Can um, we bring nurses into this converse, conversation. We need to invite nurses in this dialogue because yes, Ashma and, and, and or maybe other startups and other folks are thinking of the solution, but co-creation is the key. Many well-intended solutions in the past have less, have caused this cognitive overload that we're now talking about. And we can call it click fatigue, we can call, call it many different words, but the end, uh, the trick is to achieve the transformation and help them without overwhelming system with new technologies, new point solutions. And I think that's where it needs to go. No, so smart, Ashma. And you know, this methodology and what you're talking about is absolutely critical. And you know, John, and I, you've been around healthcare, as we've said, um, at those front lines working with nurses. And you know, when Rhonda mentioned, and you just heard that the largest exodus is actually nurses with less than one year of experience. This is a, a turn from anything we've ever seen historically in the United States. It's always been, you know, older populations that tend to retire in certain segments. But what is your opinion on what you're seeing in this burnout? And how is it different today than what we've experienced? over the history of the past, you know, 10, 20 years in healthcare? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I just, to, to kind of double down on a little bit of Rhonda's comment, um, I think that, that um, it's really important in delivering technology that the technology understands the actual clinical process that's in place and that the clinical process itself has been reimagined before the technology lands, okay? Technology develops really fast. Changing administrative models around clinical workflow structure, team compositions, differential shift configurations, different staffing models. Those are, I think Rhonda can comment, those are very challenging to get implemented in the field with speed. And when those clinical models, when the fundamental clinical care model is not redesigned, I would suggest to you, you can throw a ton of new technology at it and it's not gonna work very well. So I think in driving a solution to this, uh, co-creation may be the term you wanna use, but there's gotta be a symbiosis between the clinical care model itself and the new technology and that care model shouldn't be driven by the technology, but informed by the capability the technology can bring, right? I think relative to how burnout differs today than it, than it did before, I think it gets more press today. I think, I think people are more aware of it. And so it's, um, it gets attention, but 15 years ago when I was practicing, you know, adult cardiac surgery, we had brand new nurses get dumped into the ICU, taking care of fresh hearts, and they were totally overwhelmed. And it actually wasn't technology. It was the care model they were expected to suddenly adapt to. Absolutely. And, and, and David, you know, you're on the, the front line of a very large nursing workforce. And, you know, the, this idea of technology and being able to work better for the nurse, um, as you've just been hearing, you know, it's not something that we've thought of, you know, in healthcare, it, it has not been done well. And what have you been, you know, what are you seeing from your experiences and direction into this area? 
You know, I think, uh, as we mentioned, I, actually, I, after Rhonda was speaking, I wanted to say, amen, amen. You know, it's like, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, everything I've been hearing. I'm not, again, not a nurse, but you know, we do get a chance to talk to hundreds, thousands of nurses, giving us feedback all along and why, why they, uh, why they're kind of leaving full-time work and health systems uh, to kind of go to these other models. And, and I'll just, you know, rehash. Uh, I think, I think the fact that we can't, we, we should be blowing up and looking at scheduling from a completely fresh perspective. Um, I, I love the way also Rhonda talks about, you know, let tech carry the burden of memory. Uh, I had this uh, nurse tell me the other, she was, she was telling me all the things that she had to remember before she checked out or before she was done with her, her shift. And, uh, and whew, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm in my fifties or something, but there's no way I would have remembered all that, you know? So uh, I, I'm, I, I'm feeling because if you do have that kind of mental list going, that also is a burden, you know? So, and I, and I, I think it's also smart to be questioning kind of what's the regulatory environment, you know, uh, so anyway, I, I, I'm just echoing what y'all have said. So I, I think uh, uh, I think this is it's time. Um, and I think maybe John Ashma said this. Now is the time. Now is the time to affect change. When when any uh, society is hit with a massive, um, you know, detrimental effect or event, um, that's when people are most open to change. I'd say the the staffing crisis we have currently is uh, certainly of, of uh, monumental proportions in healthcare. And now's the time to really just pull it apart and, and re-examine. You know, and I, I think you're absolutely right. And there's something fundamentally to this conversation I wanna bring forward, which is the reason that individuals and patients are in hospitals or in nursing homes is to receive nursing care. Because the truth is, it, uh, it, you know, surgery or occupational therapy or PT, all of that could be done in outpatient settings, right? And in, in nursing, but the truth is you're in a hospital and in a nursing home because it is required to have 24 seven coverage seven days a week to keep you alive if you are not in that setting. And the question that I wanna to ask to you is because we know this shortage exists. So like this is, we're having a 20% shortage of nurses in hospitals. We have 130% turnover within nursing homes at this point in time. There is not enough nurses to go around. So how can technology um, and why should technology be co-created with nurses to help them actually practice to the top of their license? Because I think, you know, we've heard Ashima say this before, you know, it's really important to have nurses engaged and, you know, Ashima, let's start with you on this and, and, and why this perspective is going to be absolutely critical to, to the future of healthcare in a really meaningful way. Thank you, Rebecca. I think this is a very important subject and topic. And to be honest, I think the skills that nurses truly need are really, it's, a, it's back to basics, how to engage, communicate, and empathize with patients, give them compassionate care. But the things that get in the way of delivering that compassionate care are the things that we can help with, right? I, I'll be the first to say technology is not the panacea, but there is cognitive overload that we talked about, right? So uh, AI-driven digital health technologies have a promise, and it can promote that compassionate care by taking the stuff off of the plate of the nurses. Can we make it easy uh, for documentation when you're talking about EHR, note-taking, can voice be the interface and when a person or a patient is being discharged or being moved from department to a different department, can we gain insight from the clinical notes and, and provide them some context around the patient without them having to go through the pages and pages of clinical notes and figure out what's, what's going on with the patient. So I believe to do that, we need to understand the clinical workflows. They are underappreciated that Dr. Perolo said, totally agree. You need to understand the workflow, but in terms of cognitive overload, technology has created a, a uh, the cognitive overload and, and that can lead to exhaustion. It has led to exhaustion. So I believe the way to move forward or to heal the burnout is really inviting nurses to engage in this dialogue and being conscious of that, that our way of rolling things out in the past 
we need to test, we need to listen, we need to learn, and we need to be iterative in that approach. And in nurses are key stakeholders. So it's not a technology that we create and hand it to them. And I can't stress, stress it enough. And this was one of the projects that I worked um, with Dr. Perot, not in the nurses side, but this whole user research, being on the side, seeing what is important to them. It, you cannot understate the benefit of doing that. But we also need to know there are language models like GPT that can create this note taking, the NLP, the voice, the, that's the promise that exists. And, and it also goes back to the data interoperability. Today, the data lives in silos, it's fragmented. And yet we are keeping a human carry that cognitive workload of, okay, connecting the dots in these different siloed systems. We need to fix that. We need to provide a simpler answer to that. Absolutely. And, you know, Rhonda, you're the chief nursing officer of a medical device company and, you know, putting nurses front and center on those executive committees. But what are you seeing from the, the value when you co-create alongside technologies, uh, alongside nursing? Yeah, I'll give you a story. Uh, years ago, I, I was working for a, a medical device company and I was in the room with a, a bunch of engineers who were showing me a workflow on the device. And I said, oh, I, I mean, what can happen if they do this or that? And they said, well, you would have an unintentional overinfusion of a medication. And I said, oh, well, that has to be fixed. And so we went round and round and round over it. And finally, one of the engineers said to me, it's not even logical that someone would do this. And I said, I didn't say it was logical. I said, someone was going to do it. And it was it was less than a year until it happened, and I'm I'm not um, I'm not throwing shade at anybody or any situation, but those are conversations that happen all the time, and so you have to look at you know really understanding again how nurses work. You have to understand how technology works because technology works in a certain way too, and sometimes that limits us. And I think it's a matter of educating and, um, you know, getting the feedback and the workflow driven, you know, in my business, I, we're always trying to understand how do we, communication is the foundation of everything. And so when, when communication works, it's a solid environment. When it doesn't work, it's a fractured environment. And so that's what we focus on. And I frequently said, and I think John can uh, testify to this, as a nurse, nobody ever asked me how I wanted to be communicated with. They never asked me if I wanted to be paged on my personal phone or any. I mean, I just had to take whatever came at me in whatever direction it came from at whatever time of day it came. And I had to deal with it. And not only that, I had to know specialists and subspecialists, and I had to know all of their preferences. So I might have 10 different preferences on just how to be contacted on one patient. But that's all information that clogs up everything. And when we talk about cognitive overload, which is something I've been writing and speaking on for probably three years now, those are the things that I'm talking about. It's not, it's very rarely this, this huge clinical uh, concept or notion or practice guidance. It's always just trying to take care of the patients and make sure that information is not left out that can cause harm that um, clinicians don't get fatigued from everything they have to do and cause harm. Um, we want everyone to be safe, the clinicians, the, the patients, these are all the things. And so I, I look at um, technology is an assistant. It's not the thing, it is, it's the assistant to the thing. And um, that's where we have to go with it. And so I, I think that we can get wrapped around the axle, if you will, just talking about features and functions and what we need to do and all of this, when in reality, we have to look at the state of the individual trying to do the job, and then we surround them with the capabilities of technology, whether that's information, the ability to talk to whoever they need to talk to at the right time, consolidating platforms, you know, the EHR has done a good job with that, but it's also been quite challenging to expand beyond that. And, and my personal feeling is we've talked to EHRs to death. We need to talk about now, how do we integrate what needs to be integrated with those to really enable and, and make more capable uh, the people who are doing the work. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Okay, well, go ahead, Ashma. 
I was going to say, I think it's like, um, uh, to, to build on your point, but also say that during pandemic, we saw the world rallying around new solutions, new reimagination. I think that's the time now we, we invited. There was a sense of urgency. There was a common enemy called the virus and the stakeholders came to the room and I've never seen the business model reimagined so fast. So we can do it. We have done it. But at the peak of pandemic, I can tell you, we were responsible for creating this speech to scheduling board to the IC capacity, where are the oxygen beds. And I'd seen health system uploading the Excel spreadsheets to figure out where the capacity, where the ICU beds are. We have gotten better. We have automated that. Telehealth solutions were, were um, created, spun up almost overnight. So to me, this is a sense, a similar sense of urgency now to bring the stakeholders and technology is just one stakeholder, but we really need to challenge the status quo and reimagine in within the context of workflow and leverage technology where it can be beneficial. Can we take stuff off of the nurse's plate? Can we reduce the cognitive burden? And even small efficiencies can have a big impact cumulatively. But I think that's where I believe it, that uh, this is the moment, as we've all learned from pandemic, we are, as a community, very capable of working together, understanding the workflow, bringing the impact. And this is the moment now for the nursing, we need to come together. Absolutely. Well said, Ashman. You know, when I, I've heard you both been speaking, I can't help David, you obviously have been working a long time in technology and that there was something that Rhonda said about how you make sure that nobody ever asked the nurse how they wanted to be engaged with. And I think you've had a lot of experience and understanding what has been in the drivers of nursing behavior. So can you give us a little bit of insight into, you know, there's, there, there's a problem in the market and how, you know, you've been looking at that problem differently. And we've been studying that for quite a long time. Um, and it's not just the communication, it's, it's just how, how do they want to work with uh, with their employer? And uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that this can apply to everyone. But one of the things that we we care about is 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 uh, making sure that they feel like they're in control of their own lives. Right? They still want to work, um, and they want to work um, plenty of hours because they you know they need to they need to pay for their bills and so on. But um, they they need you know far more flexibility. So the first thing we did was. We said we're not going to put any restrictions on you, and let's just um, let's just make sure that uh, you have all the opportunities, you know, in front of you to work. And then we then we use a lot of machine learning too uh, to make sure that we're matching um, really based on both past behavior as well as their stated preferences. Stated preferences, unfortunately, change all the time. So you can never rely on stated preferences. You actually also have to look at the data. What did they do? And, and, and what was it that ultimately, in fact, I think it's kind of funny how something like, you know, 70% of applicants uh, at, at our company say they they want to work weekends. And then at the end of the day, it's like a very small percentage of them actually work weekends. Anyway, but the, um, but the notion is let's make sure that we know what they care about so we can get a good head start, but then use their behavior um, as, as really the more predominant uh, indicator of their preferences. The, the, the second thing that, you know, so that second thing here or within something we care about is just, um, being able to uh, allow nurses to work in different facilities. And so for us to make that work, we also have to be sure that we have the right capacity uh, in order to fill the needs in a particular facility. And so we, we actually define the world around these little micro markets. And guess what? The micro markets are actually defined by how far is a nurse willing to drive and how far is a CNA willing to drive. Um, and, and by the way, it's not miles. It'd be really nice if we could just draw a circle of radius around you know, all, all the different facilities around the world, but instead um, it is, it's time. So uh, a nurse is typically willing to drive about 45 minutes. A CNA a nurse assistant is willing to drive about 30 minutes. And if you keep that in mind, and then you also kind of match them with the right uh, thing, then, then you see uh, their, their work blossom. And, and they, and, and, and then the feedback just becomes so positive that they feel like, wow, this has been an amazingly great experience. So that, that's how, that's one of the ways that we're applying technology. 
technology in this space. I love it. And, and John, what are your thoughts on hearing all of this? Yeah, so um, I think uh, I think that the key ingredient here uh, again, across burnout, across top of license, across experience, uh, often boils down to time and how the technology we apply provides and gives time back to a person. They will, I think, nurses or any clinicians will naturally work at top of license if they have the time to do it. Uh, and, and giving them that time back does involve uh, reducing non-value add uh, kinds of activities, right? Um, but interestingly enough, in reducing those, I wanna not lose sight of what we've talked about, cognitive overload. Even transactional activities a nurse does like uh, scheduling a test at the request of a physician or based on protocol, whatever. Those are not uh, just transactional. There's cognitive work going on on the part of the nurse about when that should be done, potentially who should do it, how does it interact with other activities the patient has. And so as we're asking uh, clinical staff in general, nurses in particular, to do more of all of these things in a complex environment, I want to be really cautious that we don't kind of trivialize this idea of what cognitive means. It means understanding these activities in the context of the clinical circumstance of the patient. This is where next gen technology is going to have to use AI. It's going to have to use advanced data processing in order to actually make the assistance cognitive because you're reducing a cognitive burden, right? So it's not just a, a menial kind of a thing you're doing. I think there's a ton of value there. Uh, I mean, David mentioned a lot of examples where just either in clinical activity or in his own, in his own shop, they're doing this. That kind of capability, both advanced analytics and AI need to be core to the next level of technology that they're gonna be brought to bear. You know, Rebecca, if I could just say something about cognitive burden, it, you know, cognitive burden or cognitive load only works with a short-term memory. Short-term memory lasts anywhere from eight to 60 seconds. It's that thing that can disappear um, from, from your memory bank very, very quickly, but can also create uh, really critical situations if it's forgotten. Our long-term memory is what I call muscle memory, or it's a thing that stays with us. Also involved in cognitive load are three aspects of uh, external, internal, and germane. And the, the internal cognitive load is what I call the backpack you can't take off. That's what you and I show up to work with every day. Who's got the kids? I have an elderly mother who has, you know, issues and, you know, our financial issues. It's a thing that goes with you. And sometimes it takes up more space in your cognitive world than it needs to. Um, because it's just, that's the situation of the day, but you can't unload it. And then the environment is what delivers um, the extrinsic. Um, and, and that is what's going on. I may show up and I'm overwhelmed with, you know, patient care, or it's a very difficult environment. And so if you combine the intrinsic with the extrinsic, you can see how this load just starts to ratchet up. And then there's the germane, which is how I respond to my environment. And then when I respond to my environment, uh, if I'm so overloaded on intrinsic and extrinsic, my response might not be <laughs> exactly what it would be at any other time. This is, this is what clinicians, both nurses and physicians run from because they, they don't know what to call it. They don't know what to do. They just know how they, they feel and how frustrated they are in the environment. So when we talk about technologies and AIs and all of these things, what we're looking at is trying to ease this overwhelming burden of information that they have to make sense out of. It's like getting a, a list of names or numbers and all of a sudden now I'm responsible to make that make sense. And I have to do it very, very quickly. And I, I don't have a calendar that I can control by. If you think about when you show up at work, you may have a vague idea that you're gonna have X amount of patients, but you have quite literally no idea what's gonna happen or what's going to happen with the family. And all of those just can continue to ratchet up and ratchet up until 
um, you've reached what we have been discussing, which is burnout. And, and so I'd say, get in front of it. Look at how you can use technology or how you can use the interpersonal uh, dynamics of, of scheduling or people working with people to, to prevent that burnout. Because once you get to burnout, you, you've let it go on too long. And you've got to do something about the work environment because as I said, it's a work-related injury. So let's focus on the environment. And sometimes that just seems very overwhelming to folks, but that is the one thing that is going to make the difference. Whatever the solution is to that work environment, that's the solution. <laughs> well, you guys, awesome. it's been a really incredible conversation and we're coming up to our end of our time together. And I want to give everyone a chance to share any last thoughts or feedback yeah, and regarding to even your lives and or how your company is dealing with the issues that we've discussed today. So, you know, Ashton, I'll start with you. Thank you, Rebecca. I would like uh, us to find ways as stakeholders with nurses are one key component to inspire them with the art of possible and that we are here for them. So the question that I would pose to all of us as a healthcare ecosystem and community is what for the nurse of 2030 look like 10 years from now? And my sense is that he or she will somebody who is really good in um, enjoying what they do best, which is taking care of patients, but they also uh, have enabled the co-creation of the digital technologies, which they use, who are apt in working across care settings, home health, skilled nursing facilities, and there's a seamless exchange of data to help them do their, do their job, or as we talk about, operate them at the top of their license. To me, that's what the nursing 2030 would look like. And at the end, we all have a time sensitive opportunity to make it easy for them to deliver on the key tenet of their profession, which is to deliver compassionate care. Love it. John, final thoughts? Um, again, great conversation today and really appreciate it the chance to participate. Um, you know, in the last two decades, I've been lucky enough to be involved both in the kind of reimagining things and think about the art of what's possible and, and sometimes a little painfully in the actual translation practically of those things into something that works. And I would maybe leave the group with a tangential thought uh, just to take away um, seamlessness of data transfer is kind of the sine qua non actually of being able to make what we were talking about today real. And as, as folks go out and think about how they're gonna apply some of these thoughts, uh, at the very beginning, it is really, really important to understand in detail your data substrate and the data domains you want to actually uh, leverage because that's where the wheels come off in going from something that looks beautiful uh, in blue sky to something that actually works for a person at the sharp end of the stick. So I will, I'll leave it at that and say thanks very much again for the time. Thank you, John. Rhonda. Thank you. You know, I obviously I'm passionate about the work experience of, of the nurse specifically because I am one and I have that lived experience, uh, but also for all clinicians because ultimately it impacts the health and well being of our country. That's ultimately the health seeking public is, is the benefit of whatever we do here. Um, I, I think that we are on a collision course with nurses leaving the profession and trying to bring nurses back in. I hear lots of really exciting ideas about, you know, how do we bring back the 1 million nurses who are in the United States who are not working in nursing? You know, how do we leverage their expertise wherever it is for whatever uh, little part of what they can contribute? You know, how do we how do we think more intelligently about this and more collaborative uh, collaboratively about it? Um, in my work uh, and what I do is really focus on the lived experience of um, physicians and nurses working as a, an effective team, both inside and outside the hospital as we look at hospital at home and how do we you know, take care of sicker patients outside the four walls of the acute care hospital. We've been talking about this for decades, but truly COVID has driven us to accelerate that. 
And so we have a, a lot of work there. The other thing that I spend a great deal of time talking about is the safety of the workforce and workplace violence, which is just, um, it's really exacerbated right now. And how do we combine culture tech and protocols with technology to make a safer environment for these people coming to work. I've, I've had a nurse say to me recently, every night that I kiss my children good night, I wonder if it's the last time that I'll ever get to do that just because she's going to work in the emergency room. And so we have to be able to uh, provide safe environments. Technology can certainly support that. There's lots of conversations that have to happen. So I would think in my work and with my company, this is what we focus on, you know, how do we activate and how do we keep functional teams with information, pushing information and allowing them to then um, have the conversations they need with the right people at the right time in the right way. Thank you, Rhonda. David, last thoughts? Sure, um, and thank you all for, for uh, participating in this. Well, I've learned a ton, uh, so this is amazing. But I guess when I think about um, you know, why uh, for the last five and a half years, I've, I've really tried to understand um, what nurses, what drives nurses and what they care about. We are a nurse centric company. Um, I think we've got a long ways to go, but I think we've done some pretty, uh, some pretty good things so far. I, I think back to my experience when my mother was in uh, the nursing home the last uh, several months of her life. And, and we, um, I'd come visit her, you know, often and, and there was Rosie. Rosie was the, uh, the nurse that, uh, that came around and, and would see her quite often. And, and she, Rosie was just unflappable, the happiest person, you know, uh, I, I had ever met. And, uh, and, and it was just a tremendous experience comfort knowing that she was taking care of, of mom until uh, uh, Rosie stopped being so happy. And, uh, and, and, I, and uh, she would come in and out quickly. She wouldn't be as often. And then the, the care started to falter. And we realized, you know, my, me and my sisters, we had to help feed mom, you know, at lunchtime and make sure that she was well taken care of. And, and so I finally stopped Rosie. She said, well, we lost two other nurses um, in the facility and they haven't been able to uh, be replaced yet. And this is um, my new life. I'm now doing the work of three people. And, and, um, and you know, it's interesting, while, while you could take the point of view of, well, you know, it, it, we need to care about all the moms and the dads in these nursing homes, but at the same time, if we don't provide, you know, an opportunity for the nurses to have a better experience, you know, the rosies of the world are, are, are going to leave and, and, and they're going to find alternatives. Our, uh, you know, what we're trying to do and we, and I come at it from a, from a very technology driven perspective is to try to find and make a, a situation where nurses can flourish, can kind of be, can, can actually uh, succeed and be happy about how they're, how they're working, where they're working, as often as they're working, and the stress level and the opportunities that are in front of them. I think one of the things we're, we're very passionate about is how do we also offer them upskilling opportunities and, and, uh, and expanding um, you know, uh, their ability to work in, in many different places. So anyway, this is, this is my passion and, and we're using technology to try to drive. To thank you, John, Rhonda, Ashman, David, and thank you to everyone who tuned into this TechCrunch webinar. Can technology solve the nursing staffing crisis? Because as you heard today, it's going to take a lot of us doing a lot of different things and focusing on the nursing staffing shortage to make a difference in the future to the healthcare future of the United States. Thank you so much for being here.